All right, cool. Thanks. This is so exciting. We've got a packed house, standing room only. Thanks so much for making time at the beginning of the conference uh, to come and see my talk, and you thought you knew EC2. Uh, so my name is Ben Whaley. I'm the director of security and operations at Countable, which is a trade finance company in San Francisco, just a startup. So this is one of the talks in the community track of uh, reInvent, where people that are involved somehow in the community, user group leaders, people that are contributors on Reddit, people that um, author blog articles, the folks from A Cloud Guru were here talking. So uh, this is part of the community day, and the fact that you're here means you're part of the community. So um, thanks for participating. We really appreciate it. We being everybody in the community. I'm not part of Amazon. Um, so I. Um, I wanted to do a talk on EC2 because it's one of these services that is beloved by everybody. It's got real breadth to it, as opposed to, you know, um, an example is IoT or Greengrass. There's a bunch of services that are specific niches, and there's going to be, you're going to get your fill of that throughout the week, but EC2 is beloved by all. It's not the first AWS service. The first one, I believe, the owner goes to SQS. S3 was also a predecessor, but it is one of the oldest. Um, and I found that I tend to get stuck in a little bit of a rut with a service that I know and love, and I kind of assume I'm on cruise control, I know everything about it, until one day I was browsing the EC2 console, and I realized there's a bunch of links on the left side of that console where all the different areas are, and I'd never clicked on those links, and I didn't even know what that stuff did, and I thought maybe it's time for a little refresher course on, uh, on what EC2 is and what some of the new stuff that had been introduced is. So that's kind of what inspired this talk. Now, I'm going to put my hat out in the ring for the talk that is most likely to be completely out of date by the end of the week. If you know how reInvent goes, it tends to, um, there's lots of announcements, and EC2 is one of these services that's iterated on rapidly. So some of this stuff is going to be out of date, but nonetheless, I hope that this session will convince you that there's a lot of innovation going on in EC2, even though it's one of these older services, uh, and there's a lot to talk about and a lot to love. So we're going to take this a little you know, lighthearted, less serious. Let's not take ourselves so seriously. The rest of the week, there's going to be plenty of time for serious business. Let's just have a little fun. So I'm going to kind of review the state of the art with EC2, kind of where things lie today. I have a quick demo to show you, and I'm going to run through some community source pro tips to wrap things up. So let's get to it. So I actually put this talk together, a version of this talk, for Community Day in San Francisco back in June. And I thought, you know, I'll just do a quick catch up to make sure I didn't miss anything. And this is a list of all of the blog posts, all of the titles that I read through just since June to catch my slides up to date. I had to be really choosy about what to include. So you can see that the pace of innovation on such an old service is still so rapid. It's really exciting. And what better place to start than with instance types? There's lots of instance types. There's something like 14 different total instance types now. These are some of the most recent ones. The C5s announced at reInvent last year, but only saw the light of day in the last month or so. So these are the compute-optimized Intel Skylake processors, great for compute-intensive workloads. Somebody measured 1.4 teraflops on the C5 18XL instances. So really good instances to choose for those compute-heavy uh, workloads. The P3 instance types, these are next generation GPU instances with up to eight GPUs on a, on a single instance, great for machine learning, high, for high performance computing use cases. We have a couple of memory intensive instance types, the R4s, the X1Es, X1Es capable of 3.8 terabytes and 128 virtual CPUs, vCPUs, um, so great for those enterprise workloads like SAP HANA in memory databases. The i3s, these are, my fav these are some of my favorites. Um, these have local ephemeral SSDs, and if you raid them all together on the highest end, you're, you're capable of up to 300,000 IOPS. Some super strong performance. These are great for uh, time series databases. I like this for InfluxDB or for NoSQL databases like Cassandra. So uh, check these out for best performance for that type of use case. And finally, last but not least, the D2s, kind of the data warehouse instance with up to 43 terabytes of local storage. So kind of caught up there with instance types, but also there's all sorts of EBS volume variety now. Um, kind of going from most to least expensive, those IO1s, these are the provisioned IOPS EBS volumes that you can kind of get guaranteed number of IOPS uh, for your volume. The GP2s are my go-to 
uh, my go-to drive. This is what I choose on a day-to-day -day basis. They're not as expensive as those I.O. ones, but uh, they still have great I.O. And then we've got two spinning disk types of EBS volumes we can attach to EC2 instances, the ST ones, the SC ones. These, um, these are optimized for throughput, much lower I.O. If you don't if you're not very concerned about performance for a particular workload, you can choose those SC1s for uh, the most cost-effective approach. So let's review quickly some of the features that have launched in the past 6 to 12 months um, that may not be directly in EC2, but they impact your EC2 use cases a lot. And for me, the big one, and I think probably for the community at large, is IPv6. So for a long time, the community was clamoring for IPv6 support, and now we have it. Uh, it's not complete in the platform. It's not ubiquitous, but there is support in a lot of places. We have it in VPCs. We can attach IPv6 addresses to EC2 instances. So if you have a use case where you need to integrate with an IPv6 network, or if you're working with users um, and you need to reach out to, to their IPv6 machines, maybe you're working in emerging markets like I do with Countable, um, this is an important feature for you. So uh, just sort of as a best practice, I enable all new VPCs. I just enable IPv6. It can't really hurt supported by security groups, uh, kind of has everything you need. This one was really a surprise. So if you have any history with EC2, you know that it's been based on the Zen hypervisor. Um, and recently, with the C5 instance announcement, uh, they announced that the KVM has replaced Zen for all new instance types. So I was pretty caught off guard by that, and it does make me wonder what the future of the Zen project is, since KVM, of course, is built into the Linux kernel. Um, I kind of wonder if Zen's time is limited. AWS was clearly the largest user of, of that hypervisor. And interestingly, they have since removed the KVM mention from the C5 article. So if you go read the C5 announcement, you won't see a mention of this now. So I'm not sure why they removed it. But what is clear is that as users of EC2, this doesn't impact us. Our interface, our use case of EC2 isn't going to change. Um, but under the hood, that's what's happening. And I think that's interesting. The Elastic Network Adapter, this isn't brand new. I think it's been around for at least 18 months or something, but it is finally starting to get an uptick because all of the new instance types support it, capable of up to 25 gigabit. So super good for moving data around inside an AWS network. Um, make sure that you check the documentation, of course, to make sure it's compatible with your instance type. I normally steer clear of cost issues. I leave that to Corey Quinn and Last Week in AWS. If you're not familiar, you should check that out, lastweekinaws.com, I think it is. It's a weekly um, feature release kind of a blog. He's really good at cost optimization. He knows all about it. But this one's just too good not to mention, because now, um, after 60 seconds, your EC2 instance is billed per second. That applies to all EC2 instances, the spot market, um, on-demand instances, reserve instances. So you can really achieve, achieve some nice cost savings by going with per second, by this per second billing change, and you don't even have to do anything. One uh, optimization you could make is to really aggressively tune your auto-scaling groups so that they, you know, they're more aggressive about starting and stopping instances. Somebody reported that they saved 30% thanks to the per second billing feature. So that's awesome. Elastic GPUs were made generally available sometime in October, November, first announced, I think, back in May-ish. So these let you attach GPUs to any type of, or most types of EC2 instances. So you get the flexibility of choosing the type of EC2 instance you want um, and still attaching GPU for those kinds of workloads that need it. Now, uh, these are not going to be as performant as the P3 instances with the locally attached GPUs. Like I said, you can get up to eight local GPUs on those. And they also share the network bandwidth, much like an EBS volume does, with your instance. So kind of be aware with that if you're playing with these. But it is pretty cool to have an elastic you know, network-attached GPU. This is a small feature, but I thought it was worth mentioning. If you uh, can imagine how you normally set up auto-scaling groups, you kind of need two scaling policies. You need something to help you scale out and something to help you scale in. So imagine it's uh, CPU usage. You might add an instance at 80% CPU. You might remove an instance at 30% CPU usage to achieve some cost savings. Well, now you can just set a target. I want to I have a 60% uh, normal CPU usage, and it will automatically adjust the number of instances um, to, to make that happen. So kind of a simple automation fix. Last but not least, lots of new regions. In 2016, AWS added five new regions, Ohio, Canada, London, Mumbai, and Seoul. 
And each of those has at least two data centers. So I just like to kind of ponder what is the logistical effort that it takes to bring online a single data center, let alone at least 10. I think that's a real achievement, and there's a lot more on the way. There's China, Paris, Stockholm, Hong Kong, and Bahrain have been announced. On my personal wish list is a region in Africa. Anywhere in Africa will do. I'll take Kenya, please. I would also love some CloudFront edge locations in Kenya. There are none. If you look at the regional, the global map of AWS presence, um, there's nothing at all in Africa. So as a person that works in the African market frequently, if there's anybody that's on the data center team out there, I would like to see that. So let's shift our attention for a moment to CloudWatch which is one of these services that is so interlinked with EC2 that I, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't pass it by. Looks like we're getting a little of the side cut off there. Sorry about that. So um, there's a bunch of areas of CloudWatch kind of worth talking about. The big one, the thing that's seeing the most attention recently is event handling. So it serves as the glue between services. You can, uh, event can happen in one service, and thanks to CloudWatch events, you can tie it and link it up to some other services. And I'm gonna give an example of that in a minute. Metrics, of course, this is one of the central features of CloudWatch, a place for you to ship up information about your EC2 instances and all of your other AWS services and uh, gather kind of real-time indications as to how your applications and services are performing. Scheduled tasks gives you the ability to run jobs on a schedule, a long missing feature. And finally, logs. This is, I think, the first uh, release of CloudWatch was logs. It's a place to centralize all your logs. So let's take a brief, uh, deeper look, starting with scheduled events, because this is my favorite feature. It gives you this distributed cron-like ability to execute an event, some kind of uh, task on a schedule. And for a long time, this was so, such a missing part of AWS. And there was a Stack Overflow question that had hundreds of upvotes. And the, the solutions to achieve a cron-like experience in a distributed fashion were varied and sorted. And it was very complicated. You either had one EC2 instance, and then you had a single point of failure for all of your cron jobs to run on, or you had to implement some kind of complex software with locking to achieve a distributed cron to have some fault tolerance. Well, now, thanks to the scheduled events, you can give it a cron expression. You can tell it to execute a Lambda function or do something else, and it will do it on your schedule. So that's been a super nice feature, one of my favorites. Now we can have CloudWatch events interact with EC2 in all sorts of different ways. A few of those. One is the instance change, uh, instance state changes. So when an EC2 instance goes from pending to running, from running to stopping, to stopping to terminated, we can get notified at the time each one of those things takes place, and we can take some action in response to that. Maybe we need our instance to be initialized um, in configuration management system, or maybe we need to, need to deprovision our instance somehow or uh, perform some cleanup, cleanup act when the instance goes away. So we can have CloudWatch events to, to make that happen for us. Systems Manager, the EC2 Systems Manager is uh, another service I'm gonna talk about in a minute. We can tie in with all of the Systems Manager events when a run command executes, when we change parameters in the parameter store. Maintenance windows, if you have an RDS instance or an EC2 instance that's scheduled for maintenance, we can be notified when that's gonna happen and then we can cause some event to occur uh, to adjust for that. Maybe we need to expect lower performance, maybe we need to launch some more capacity in response to that. We can subscribe to the ECS event stream. So when tasks start and stop on our ECS cluster or something's going on, we can tune into that and adjust as needed. Same thing goes for EBS snap snapshots. When a new one is created, when an encryption, encryption or decryption event happens, we can be notified about that. And finally, this cross-account event delivery gives us the ability to really expand our um, federated account solution, it's, which I see uh, more and more commonly, where we have a central account and a bunch of sub-accounts kind of linked together, and maybe everybody's using that central account um, for management, and well, now it can collect events from all of the other accounts. So in combination, this makes for this really nice pipeline that it, to me is one of the primary, um, the underlying features of AWS that's so critical, is the tie in the integration between services, and CloudWatch, event, CloudWatch events really brings that to life. And the other side, of course, is CloudWatch telemetry. So this is our logs and metrics. For the longest time, we had basic monitoring, which gave us five minutes, not nearly good enough, and one minute, detailed monitoring for a, for a higher cost. Well, recently they've launched custom metrics with a high resolution, one second for three hours, and corresponding with that, high resolution alarms. So any operations person will tell you that 60 seconds is not good enough resolution. We really need to be notified uh, kind of more frequently and know exactly what's going on with applications and services running in our, our environment. And thanks to this, we're, we're able to do that. Collect D, if you're not familiar, is a daemon that runs, it's 
I think it's just for Linux. It's probably for some other Unixes too. Um, it collects all sorts of system metrics from your, your instances. So normally you'd use it for things like CPU load, memory utilization, you know, the state of TCP and UDP network sockets. You can collect any kind of data you want because you can execute an arbitrary script. And as long as it writes out in the right format, you're good to go. There's a built-in CloudWatch plugin for CollectD. So you can uh, use CollectD to ship data right into CloudWatch. I really like that. The dashboard features of CloudWatch have gotten a lot better. There's a graphical interface to make dashboards out of the metrics that you have in CloudWatch metrics. You can use a CLI to, uh, to manage your dashboards. So this is a nice tool. I think Grafana is still, it's, for me, is still the winner, probably for a lot of people. But for simple needs, I think you could pretty much get away with just CloudWatch dashboards, which is a far cry from where it was a few years ago. This was important for any metric nerd out there. You know that. Uh, CloudWatch for the longest time had only average. So if you, you know, if you have a set of users who are having a really great experience using your, your application, they have super fast performance, but then you have a whole chunk of users that are having a really bad time, it's going really slow, average doesn't expose that to you, right? You wouldn't know that that's occurring. So the introduction of these percentile statistics, and in particular, the P99 statistic, this gives you an idea of what most people are experiencing. So ignore average and pay attention to this P99. That was an important introduction. Logs is this, this the central place to collect, collect logs for out, throughout your AWS uh, applications. You know, it integrates well with um, with Lambda functions, with Beanstalk, you can write it in easily into your own applications that run on EC2. And thanks to metric filters, you can actually parse the logs as they arrive and take some action on them. Uh, maybe you want to know if your web servers are seeing a spike in 500 status code responses or 400 status code responses. You can parse out the information out of it and set up CloudWatch alarms to, alarm, to alert you to that. What I do actually is send all my logs into Sumo Logic. Pick your favorite service. It doesn't really matter what it is. But Sumo Logic provides a Lambda function that will pick up CloudWatch log groups and ship them over to, to Sumo Logic. So there's nothing for me to manage. I don't have to install an agent. I don't have to do any kind of uh, custom configuration. It just works um, because of this kind of glue feature like I've been alluding to throughout. Shifting, shifting focus again to the EC2 container service. I had the opportunity to look at this really early on in its life. I think I was in the beta. It was around November, December of 2014. And at the time, container service was just a set of primitives. And it's come a really long way. And so I want to touch on some of the uh, most important feature announcements that have happened in the past year or so with the container service. Um, the first thing that came out, this wasn't actually present at the time that I was evaluating, it was the container registry. So this provides you with a Docker image registry hosted in AWS, integrated with IAM. There's that word again, integration. It's all about the integrations, right? Um, so this really is the best Docker registry to use on AWS. Otherwise, you're going to be running it yourself. This is fully hands-off, fully managed. Um, definitely recommend it whether you're using ECS or not. This was a recent addition to ECS. Um, so a Container task definition is a JSON description of what you want an ECS task to look like. It says, here's the image I want to run, here's how much CPU and memory it needs, here's the ports that it listens on, and other like, data about your container. And so now we also have the ability to pass in device flags. So I could do something like attach an EBS volume to the host and then pass that EBS volume through to the container using the device flag. And it also gives you the ability to execute a custom init process in your container. Previously, you would run into a situation where your process maybe exited or got into some kind of a zombie state and was still taking up uh, CPU cycles from your cluster. It wasn't dying properly. Well, with, if you ex execute instead a custom init process, it's going to be sure that it's killed off and kind of save you some capacity there. So um, these little improvements make a big difference, too. We just talked about CloudWatch metrics, and it's fully integrated with ECS. You get your CPU and memory, memory utilization across the cluster that way. This was important for anybody in the room interested in security. For the longest time, your ECS tasks shared the IAM role with the host, right? So this meant that any task you had running on a container, a container node uh, was sharing all the permissions of the host. So they had to be overly permissive. Well, now we can assign an IAM role specific to a task, giving it truly least privilege permissions. So that's been a big security win. I don't know if you remember github.com slash blocks. This was announced last year at reInvent. It is an open source scheduler for ECS. You could write your own custom scheduler using the hooks and libraries they provide. 
For the first eight or nine months of the project, it kind of looked dead to me. It wasn't seeing much activity. But in the past two to three months, it's really picked up. There's a roadmap with milestones. It seems like they're headed towards a 1.0 release. So you can see an example of how the open source scheduler uh, works. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see some announcement, just, be, just given kind of the timing on all this activity. Some awesome third-party tooling has emerged. Convox is a tool, a Heroku-like pass tool for ECS that makes it much easier to interact with ECS services. Empire kind of has similar go goals. It's written by the folks at Remind. If you're not familiar with Remind's tooling, you should check it out. Um, they have some really great open source stuff. I rely on their tool stacker all the time. Um, <clears throat> so it's been great to see some third-party uh, tooling there. Integration with application load balancer is deep and great, actually. So when you launch a task, you can be sure that it's going to wire up to the right port with the load balancer. Load balancer is going to be do doing health checks. No custom routing, no cu custom wiring required. Fully hands off. Um, I've been a big fan of the load balancer. I've been waiting for a bunch of those features for a long time. Thanks to those CloudWatch events, we can, uh, the scheduled events, we can run things on a schedule on our ECS cluster, run a task, like a batch job if we need to, and we can also execute tasks in response to some other event. So it's, once again, reiterating this pipeline, this integration with services, ECS tasks can run kind of on an ad hoc basis um, in response to other events happening. So the container service is really showing some maturity, and I think it's probably the fastest and easiest way to get started with container orchestration out there. Let's move on to the systems manager, which has had a lot of attention recently. Um, I'd say that it gives superpowers for EC2 instances and for your on-premises systems if you work in kind of a hybrid environment. So let's review some of the main features of the systems manager. Remote command execution using run commands. So the idea is that you can send, you can tell the systems manager to run a command on your instances, and it will go and do that on the instances that you specify using a filter, like based on tags or something, uh, and then collect the output and show you what the output was. So it lets you run commands on your boxes without logging into your boxes, something we've all needed for a long time. The parameter store is a place to source, store secrets and configuration data in a hierarchical format. So you can think of it similar to something like HashiCorp's console uh, or etcd, although you know, the, the comparison's not perfect there. Um, but it, is, it does fill a nice gap, and it kind of closes the loop. Because today, we can store a secret in the parameter store. We can generate, say we, we need a password. We can generate a password in memory, store it in the parameter store in an encrypted format, download it on our instance as needed at boot, and it never needs to live anywhere unencrypted. You don't even need to know what it is. And I think that's really nice, because this has been a vulnerability for a long time, having credentials in plain text. And we're finally at a place where everybody agrees, maybe that's not such a good idea. We can run periodic tasks. I'm going to breeze through these last couple ones. Periodic tasks with the state manager and with maintenance windows. So um, you can set up automation workflows for setting up new nodes. For example, you've got a new node booting up. You can execute a series of steps to join that node and kind of assimilate it into your env environment. And then finally, there's some compliance-related features of the systems manager. You can set up an inventory of your EC2 fleet, and you can collect patch status about your instances so you know kind of what kernel revision they're at. Um, this feature for a long time was Windows only. I'm actually not sure whether that's changed or not yet. A couple of the key benefits that you get from it. Um, a big one is that all the actions are recorded in CloudTrail, which means that you have an immutable audit log of everything that happens. So if somebody executes a command using the run command, you know exactly when it was executed, who executed it. You can prove to an auditor or a compliance officer that you have a nice trail. So that's, in, that's important, especially for enterprises. You can get triggers to, with CloudFront for systems manager events. Um, and you can also store command history and output in S3. So what this means is you can execute in the response to something else happening in your AWS account. You can um, execute an SNS notification or a Lambda function. And when you run a run command, uh, the command history will be stored in S3. You can use something like, um, like Athena to analyze that output and just sort of keep track of what your instances are up to. Importantly, we now have fine-grained control over what people can run. So traditionally, if you give people SSH access, it's kind of this unfettered, you basically 
if, if I give somebody even non-root access, I still assume that they have root, right? Because local, local privilege escalation exploits are really common. So you can assume if they have a shell, probably they can elevate their privileges. But not so with run commands. You can give somebody access to just a specific command. You know when they ran it. You know what the output was. You can control one group that has administrative access, one group that has you know, just permissions to restart a service or something. So set up some run commands and then specify the access control around that. And then there's integration with the AWS config service, more compliance related stuff so you can track changes to your instances over time. You can see how, they, um, how the state's changing. SSM works off the concept of an agent being installed on your boxes. It's an open source executable, works in Linux and Windows, and importantly, it works on your on-premises systems just as well as in the cloud. So you can give an IAM role, you can assume a role for the on-premises instances, and all it needs is permission to, ex uh, to interface with the SSM API. You can install it at boot, you can install it at runtime, you can, you can bake it into your image, it doesn't matter how it gets there. Once it's running, it just pulls the, a the uh, API for commands, and if it sees something it needs to do, it executes and reports back home. So it's really a pretty simple model. This is an example of what a, a run command document looks like. If you're familiar with CloudFormation, you know that you design a template, you submit the template, and then you tell CloudFormation, start up this stack using this template and these parameters. And this is exactly the same idea. So two chunks to look at here. The bottom section is really the meat of it. It's saying, hey, this is a, a document to run a shell script. And it passes one parameter, a com the commands that you want to run. So what you would do is create this document in a JSON file, tell the SSM that this is um, a document that you want, and then you can invoke it and pass the parameters. You want to do a directory listing, add a user account, restart a service, you just kind of pass it and invoke it. And now I want to switch to a quick demo. So I got really excited about the parameter store. You probably could tell, like, I'm excited to have this closed loop thing going on where I no longer have to have plain text credentials. But I found the interface to be a little clunky. Um, it's fine, you know, it gets the job done, but it's a bit verbose, and I found some bugs in the EC2 console version of the parameter store, and so I started kind of fooling around with, um, with this really simple shell. It's nothing uh, too crazy, but I want to do a quick demo. Before I jump into that, I just want a show of hands from folks. Who knows the Game of Thrones to, a, to some extent? Who's familiar with it? A good amount, probably about half the audience, and then another 30% who didn't raise their hand, probably. That's totally fine. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so you're about to get a dose of Game of Thrones, whether you like it or not. For those that are familiar, um, hopefully this is mildly en entertaining, and uh, for those that it's not familiar, sorry about that. Oh, I have to push a button. Let's see, this button. Is that pretty visible to folks in the back? Okay, cool. So, um, so I can just open my shell, and this drops me into the root of the parameter store. So you just get a slash indicating that I'm at the root, and I'm gonna start with just a long recursive listing of all the parameters using familiar Linux, Unix-like commands. I can see a recursive listing, and what I have here is the noble houses of Game of Thrones in parameter format, and I'm gonna explain what this means a little bit here in a minute. It's kind of separated out, but I can, you know, I can get a parameter, like I can, I'm gonna go ahead and CD into the Stark family, the nobility of the Stark family. And I can, I'll clear the screen. Uh, I can see Eddard and Caitlin Stark and all of their children. I can get Sansa Stark. I can see what her, her value is. I can see the, the history because Parameter Store keeps track of versions of a parameter. So Sansa Stark is just a parameter separated by slashes. So I can see I was the last one to modify her. I know that she gets married to Tyrion at some point in the show, so I can copy Sansa Stark to House Lannister Noble, and now she's, she's present there, along with all of the other Lannister family, and then that doesn't really work out between the two of them, so she gets removed. <laughs> and I can play with secrets, too, so you can put new values, like I could do put name is secret, type is secure string, which means it's also case insensitive, um, but I have that out of habit. And I can say like my, my secret. And so now if I get slash secret, all I see is an encoded encrypted value. And if I turn on decryption and I get it again, 
Now I can see that it's decrypted, of course I can remove it, and I can do things like recursive operations, which as far as I know is not possible using uh, other interfaces to this. So I can do house Stark to house Lannister, and it will recursively copy all of the Starks into the Lannisters. Lannister, Stark. No command completion yet, unfortunately. But that doesn't make any sense, so I can recursively remove them too. Uh, Lannister, Stark. Um, and then I can do inline commands. I can say pssh get. Uh, I guess I'll type it out again. Stark, S Noble, sounds so Stark. Or I can pipe it in as standard input. So nothing groundbreaking there, right? But just kind of a convenience for working with the parameter store. So I was getting a little deep into the Game of Thrones at this time. If you go and look at this open source project, you'll see that the README is like House of Game of Thrones. Did I say House of Cards? I meant Game of Thrones. It's Game of Thrones centric. The test cases are Game of Thrones centric. So I was really kind of thinking in this and I realized, you know, I could actually kind of mock the whole transition in the whole series of events of Game of Thrones in the parameter store. Because if you think about Game of Thrones, it's really just a bunch of things happening to people in these noble houses. Uh, somebody dies, that house loses some power. Somebody becomes a king, that, that house gains some power. So I decided to devise a little game that would show off some of the services uh, that I've been talking about so far. So let's take a look at what that looks like. And I have to push a button again. I think I have to push this button. Yes. Yeah, so I called it the transfer of power. And let's, let me visualize for you what, what the outcome needs to be. Um, each house gets a certain point value depending on the number of people in the house and the attributes of those people. And in the end, what I want to see is a chart that shows kind of what the starting state is and what the end state was uh, for, for each house and kind of what their point value is. And in theory, based on changing events throughout the series, you should see the points transition. And so here's how I went about it. We used PSSH, the tool I just demoed, to batch load in the events of the Game of Thrones into the parameter store. And then we subscribe to that using this CloudWatch event feature. We see all of the changes to the parameters and we invoke a Lambda function. The Lambda function's job is to keep track of the score for the house. And so it, it tracks the changes to the parameter store, updates the score in a Redis instance on ElastiCache, and then sends the new value to a CloudWatch metric, and then we can use Grafana to watch the CloudWatch metric. So it's kind of fun. I fully acknowledge that this is perhaps the most kludgy, clunky way to accomplish this thing that there is. Right? You could do this whole task with just a spreadsheet. It's a very simple thing, concept. But that wouldn't demonstrate any of these fun features. So that, so that wasn't going to do. Unfortunately, there is a fatal flaw in the design. And the flaw is that CloudWatch events invoking Lambda functions are unordered. And it's pretty important to have the right order of events or the score gets all out of whack. Right? So I had to compensate this for this by introducing delays in this batch loading process. And I found 60 seconds to work pretty well. If you have 60 seconds between events, all the Lambda functions get invoked in the right time. But unfortunately, that means, sadly, I can't demonstrate the thing on stage because it would take too long. But I did capture the graph after the fact. So before I show you the outcome, I want to look at my scoring system. So this is totally arbitrary, ad hoc, invented by me at midnight in bed one night. It's probably fine tunable. You could think of a dozen ways off the top of your head to do it better. But this is what it is, and let me explain it to you. Um, you get different points depending on a property that applies to you. Most people in a noble house are noble, right? Not everybody, but most people are noble. So you get some points for being nobility. You get, you've got some extra power, like people look up to you. If you're royal, you get even more points because you have armies to command and you have control of the, the coffers. Uh, that's a word, isn't it? I think that's a word. Magical is even better. Um, you get all sorts of bonuses for being magical. On the other hand, there's some downsides. If you're handicapped, such as the case with Bran Stark or with Jamie Lannister when he loses his hand, that's bad. You like lose respect, uh, you lose some power. Or you could be in exile, which is the case with uh, Daenerys Targaryen at the beginning of the show. So you kind of lose power for that, but you can come back from that. And then there's the special deceased case. The deceased is important because normally if you're dead, like you don't matter that much to your family. You're not in the running anymore. But in Game of Thrones, you can come back to life. So we don't want to remove you completely. So with that said, let's hop one over once again and look at the outcome. Yeah. 
I think that's, it's a little fuzzy there and kind of confusing chart to look at. It's not the most exciting chart, but let's just take a quick glance at it. So what we have is lines representing the different noble houses of Westeros. The yellow line is the Baratheons, right? The Baratheons are in control at the beginning of the show. So it's separated, you can kind of draw it in half, where the left half is initializing the world, setting up all of the people in the Game of Thrones, and the right half is going through season one. I only got to the end of season one because I realized what a total waste of time it was to get through all the other seasons. <laughs> It actually takes a long time to put something together, meticulously reenacting all of the events via parameter store. <laughs> so, the Baratheons are in power, they have all these kids, Robert and Cersei are married, they're in control. Houses uh, Stark, which is blue, and Lannister, which is orange, they're also quite powerful. They're noble houses, um, they are in control of, you know, they're lords and ladies in control of a great estate. So they've got some power, but they're not royalty. They're still subservient to the Baratheons. John Aaron and the Aaron family are only represented here because they're important to the beginning of the show. And the Targaryens, of course, are kind of in exile. They've been removed from power. They're over, overseas, but they're still royal technically. So they're kind of a player still. So that's the, that's the beginning. That's the setting up of Westeros. And then commence season one. John Aaron dies. House Aaron loses power. Um, the Baratheons, Robert Baratheon dies, and then the Lannisters kind of stage this takeover of the throne, right? So the Lannisters gain power, the Baratheons lose power. The Starks, the Bran Stark falls from the tower, right? He gets handicapped, so they lose some points. And then Eddard is murdered. I mean, I guess not murdered, but technically he's murdered, really. Uh, so, they, so they lose some power, but the Targaryens gain power because she becomes the queen of the Dothraki, the mother of dragons. So we can only see kind of at the end of season one, but the whole thing works. Uh, we're seeing the transition of power starting to occur. So that is the demo I saw, or I came up with for parameter store, CloudWatch events, Lambda functions, Elastic Cache, and CloudWatch metrics. I hope that that was interesting. Um, so, let's jump into some pro tips to wrap up the session. These are sourced from myself and from other folks in the community. They're kind of like all over the place, so take what you like, like and leave the rest. We'll start with some low-hanging fruit. Maybe this is just like cliche at this point, but it wasn't that long ago when automated infrastructure was something we're all uh, excited about, it seems so fresh and new, and today I consider it to be table stakes. Like, if I'm approaching a brand new project, unless it's just a quick prototype, there's no way I'm gonna be creating things in the console or, like, running commands manually using the CLI. You need to have some tool, whatever tool you like, Terraform, CloudFormation, my choice is Stacker. Um, use whatever tool you like, but it should be checked in, version controlled, um, so that you know exactly what, what you're running. This is one of my favorite workflows for managing EC2. So probably everybody is familiar with HashiCorp's Packer. It's what we all like to use to build AMIs. Um, it's definitely the best tool for the job. What I like to use is Ansible as the provisioner for Packer, right? Packer's provisioners set up the image for you. And if you use Ansible for provisioning, then you can use the same set of playbooks for managing your EC2 instances over time, so what I like to call fleet control. Uh, it's kind of nice to have a central code base for all of it. And then I'm finding, and you probably all are too, more and more use cases for lambdas as kind of the glue, right? Like I use it for cleaning up EBS snapshots, for um, removing AMIs when they're no longer needed. There's lots of great occasions to use lambdas. So this is a nice workflow that I've found to work really well. Maybe you're familiar with this model, maybe you're not. Single node autoscaling groups. So the example I like to use is like a bastion host where um, it's important to have one instance. I don't need more than one, but I need at least one instance out there running. And it's gotta be running like all the time pretty much or some other users might have a hard time accessing it. So if that instance gets killed, it's a single point of failure. We'll throw it in a single node, in a single node autoscaling group with a min max desired capacity of one and it'll replace itself. If you are not familiar with config rules, it's a way to enforce compliance. So if your site has specific tagging schemes, or if you need EBS snapshots to be taken, snapshots to be taken on a regular basis, or you need to make sure security group rules are not open to the world, um, you can use config rules not only to alert you to the fact that maybe something is out of compliance, but it can actually make the change for you, right? It can reverse uh, changes that people have made. This is a word of warning. Uh, these are EC2 actions in IAM policy. And 
it, sometimes you can't be very granular with who has access to these things, and that can be kind of risky. For example, look at the create key pair, delete key pair uh, operations. You can't restrict which keys you can create and delete. So if you give somebody access to these two actions, then they have it kind of carte blanche, right? So if you have a production key pair, what would happen if somebody deleted it and created a new one? All subsequent instances created with that key pair would then be launched with the attacker's key. So be careful who you give these permissions to. This is by no means a definitive list. The list is really long of actions that, are, um, that don't support fine-grained resource control. If you're using any of those EBS volume types that I was talking about earlier, except for the IO1, then you, you need to keep track of the IO balance that you have. All the EBS volumes have a certain balance, and if you exceed your balance, your throughput will start to be throttled. There's a CloudWatch metric you can monitor, the burst balance. Keep an eye on that, and you'll know whether you're being throttled. Similarly, for the T2 instance types, you might recall that um, they're credit-based, and so you have a certain baseline, and you accumulate credits, and over time, if you have a certain heavy period, it'll eat into those credits, and you can track where you're at with your credit limit using these two metrics. So this is the same template as I used for the PSSH. Um, PSSH is like a little newborn baby toddler. Uh, those are like three different things, I think. <laughs> uh, compared to this AWS shell, which is really an awesome interactive shell for the uh, for the AWS CLI, it has command completion, it has, supports the full gamut of EC2, uh, or of uh, AWS services, it has built-in documentation, really a productivity enhancer. So if you're not familiar with that, you should uh, check it out. Little known fact, or I don't know, maybe people know this, I didn't know it for a long time, that network throughput increases quite a lot with each instance, each step up in instance type. So if you go from an M4 large to an M4X large, you can effectively double your throughput. So if you think you're bumping up against network I.O. limits, don't spend a lot of time like, analyzing exactly which instance type you need, necessarily. If you need to just get it done, just double your instance type, and uh, you'll know whether you had a network bottleneck or not. In cloud formation, with certain instance types, if you don't explicitly request block device mappings for your instances, you might not get those drives at all. For example, with the E3, uh, I3 instance types, they come with SSD ephemeral disks, like I was talking about earlier. But you might spin that up, and if you didn't request those ephemeral disks in your block device mapping section, they won't come, if, especially if capacity is constrained. So I always just write it into my CloudFormation templates. I've got a few SSH tips here. I'm a real ad ad SSH advocate. You know, there's just a lot of power features for SSH. Um, I'm going to share a couple of those with you. One is to enable MFA. My favorite tool for this is DuoSec. If you're not familiar with them, I think they're like an Ann Arbor, Michigan-based company. Um, and they have a really cool system where after you authenticate to your box using your public key as usual, it'll send you a push notification. If you have a, a watch, they have smart, smart apps for the watch. So I get a notification on my Apple Watch, and I say approve, and then I can log in. So it's really seamless and integrated. It's a nice way to kind of add another layer of security. If you're not familiar with fail to ban, you can get even more security. For those instances that are exposed to the internet or exposed to really wide open network ranges, use fail to ban to block servers that are, or people that are trying to brute force their way in. Control persist is a feature of SSH to let you reuse SSH connections. So if you have an established connection to a server, you can enable control persist, and subsequent connections to the same server will reuse the same connection. So you don't have to authenticate again. Latency is improved. You'll have a better time, guaranteed. The minus D flag for SSH, this is one of my favorite uh, kind of little tricks is to use minus D to enable a SOX proxy and the Switchy Omega Chrome extension uh, to, make it, to make your browser use the SOX proxy so that you can browse all of your web services and private subnets as if they're local to your workstation. Really nice for developers that didn't know this trick. If you, this is really similar to the IAM rules for ECS tasks. If you have an instance that you're running several applications on, rather than give the host really broad permissions, Assign granular permissions to each one of your apps, and then use assume role to assume those permissions, and you can be more granular. Um, this is a lesson I learned from uh, Pocket, which is a, a sub-feature of Firefox, I think. They had a compromise that involved somebody stealing user data on their instances. The user data had secrets, like plain text credentials or something else that leaked information about their environment. And if you have a redirect vulnerability in your web application, and a knowledgeable attacker could redirect to the local metadata, read your user data, and see anything that it offered. So 
Lesson one, don't keep any sensitive data in your user data. There's no reason to. I can't think of a single good reason to. And if you do have a good reason, encrypt it or do something to protect it. Little known feature of the metadata is the instance identity document. This is buried in the AWS documentation. And you can take your paranoia to the next level. Uh, it allows you to validate that you're actually on an authentic EC2 instance. So if you think you're on an EC2, or if you, if you come to an instance and you're not sure whether it's really EC2 instance or some attacker's malicious instance, you can get the metadata document, which is signed by a certificate from Amazon. They publish the public key part of it, and you can verify that it's a valid signature and that you're, in fact, on an EC2 instance and not a bad guy's instance. Linux kernel version 4.4 is a little older at this point, um, but it still is worth mentioning that you really should be on this version or later. You'll take advantage of all the latest EC2 instance type features. Um, you'll get better performance, fewer bugs from the NVMe SSDs, from the elastic network adapters like I talked about. Um, so get 4.4 or later. And in general, it's good practice to be able to replace your kernel pretty easily. Like it should be almost to the point where in your CI tool or whatever you do to run your jobs, you should be able to push a button and start to replace instances with a new, with a new image. Like that's, that's kind of what I strive for. That's my rule of thumb. Be able to replace your kernels really easily because you know, there's patches all the time. So checkip.amazonaws.com. This may be a service you've never heard of until right now, so in which case you won't care. But it is, in fact, HTTP only and does not support HTTPS, and hence it cannot be trusted. So I recommend ICANN has IP, which you can trust because it supports SSL. This is just a snippet of user data. I like to prepend this exec command to the beginning of my user data because every subsequent command executed in that script will be captured in this log file. And then if something goes wrong during host initialization, you can review your log file and see exactly what it was at a glance. So I always have this in my user data. Last pro tip, pace yourself. Don't get too crazy tonight. It's no fun to be hungover or tired all week long. It's going to be busy and exciting week. Um, I am a co-author of the Unix and Linux System Administration Handbook. We just have a new edition that came out this fall. I'm really proud of it. We're doing a book signing, and we'll give away a free, free, few free copies at the Victor Ops Happy Hour on Wednesday. I'd love to see you there. Maybe you can get a free copy. Um, so thanks again for your time. There's a mic over here. Anybody that has questions, feel free to come up and ask. Thanks. <laughs>